Hey, it's John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and it's The Entrepreneurial You, the show for dedicated and passionate Caribbean entrepreneurs seeking daily inspiration, brought to you by author, speaker, and award-winning entrepreneur, Henneka Wakis porter You must be prepared to ignite. Coming up on this episode of The Entrepreneurial You... Those super successful and well-known products came much later in our history because we took a lot of the lessons that we learned over the, you know, the first decade from like 2000 to 2010 and applied them. Welcome back to The Entrepreneurial You. I'm your host, Henneka watkis Porto. Today's episode is brought to you by Bookophilia, Peak Performers. Are you looking for a space that fosters a peaceful and productive working environment for writing and multifaceted creative expression? Then Bookophilia is the place to be. I'm super excited to speak with today's guest. He is the co-founder of Trello, the collaboration tool used by millions around the world to organize and prioritize projects using boards, lists, and cards. He's also the co-founder of Fog Creek Software for Project Management. He currently lives in Brooklyn with his wife and two daughters. I'm talking about the amazing Michael Pryor. Welcome, Michael, to The Entrepreneurial You. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. And you know what, Michael? I'm so happy that you decided to come on the the, the podcast because in the pre-interview chat, I was just saying that, you know, just starting out, not many persons are willing to take a gamble, if it were, on a podcast that hasn't even begun airing at the time of recording. So I want to say thanks to you for being so gracious. Well, I'm I'm happy to pay it forward to, um, you know, somebody else who's starting a new venture. I think that that's... You know, I was in, in your shoes uh, not, not that long ago, so I'm happy to do it. Awesome. Before we get into the thick of things, I have a fun question for you, and here it goes. If you are stranded on a desert island, what three items would you want to have with you? That's a, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> all right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do one practical one, which would be I'm going to do some snorkel fins because I'm not such a great swimmer, so that would be helpful. Okay. Um. And then a dog to keep me company. Uh, I don't currently have a dog, but I feel like if I was stuck on a on a deserted tropical island, that would be really helpful. And let's see, what's the third one? What's the third one? Uh, how about a guitar? I don't know how to play the guitar, and I bet it would take me a really long time to learn. So that would keep me occupied for a very long time. Indeed, and you would not be bored in just thinking about <laughs> being there. Yes, awesome, awesome. All right, I want to have you Michael leave your contact information so that along the way as we continue our conversation you might say something that jumps out you know at our listeners and they may want to tweet at you or or so on so go ahead and leave yeah yeah it's just my full name Michael Pryor on on Twitter it's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-P-R-Y-O-R so in the intro I mentioned very briefly what Trello is all about but I'm going to ask you now to fill in some blanks a little more for us and tell us about the unique selling proposition of this um, awesome program. Sure. Um, so, you know, the, the Trello was sort of born out of this idea when we looked around the office, we saw a lot of people using sticky notes on their wall to organize what they were working on. And um, historically, we had built a lot of tools for what I'll call a much more stretch, structured project management. And we were thinking about how easy it was for people to use these sticky notes. I mean, you've seen this, you know, people have it on their computers on their, at sure. their home, <laughs> on their fridge. It, it's a very, like people get that metaphor. Um, they, it helps them organize their thoughts and there's something about being able to see it in front of your face. And so we sort of tried to map that and basically, I don't, it's not like a digital sticky note, but that's, you know, it's essentially taking that metaphor and moving it over into the software world you create these boards, you put your sticky notes on them, you organize them into lists, and then you add other people to your board so you can see where you are and where you're going, where you've been. And it basically gives you a map for whatever kind of project that you're working on. And how would you know in the beginning, Michael, that this would be a winner? Or did you even know that it would have been a winner? I think, you know, 
historically, we spent a lot of time building tools for other software developers. And this was one of the first tools that we built where we really wanted to make something for a much broader and wider audience. So it was a big bet for us. Like from the original days, you know, we we had this audacious goal. We're saying, hey, let's build a piece of software that 100 million people could use, which is you know, that's a lot of people and seemed ridiculous at the time. Now we've had 20 million people sign up to use Trello. So it's not so far away. It's still way in front of us. But at the time, it, it was, you know, we put it out there and we launched it at a conference. It was TechCrunch Disrupt. And we got up on stage. We um, told people about it. It was actually part of a competition, which we actually lost. We didn't win the competition. We came in second. Um, but the, 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 the winner actually doesn't exist anymore. So maybe mm. that's maybe. So you maybe won pretty much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, that day we had a huge spike in signups, right? So it was very interesting, but most of the people that knew us were very technical in nature. And so what happened is over time, people would start writing these blog posts about how they use Trello to plan their wedding or how they use Trello to run their marketing team or how they use Trello to do recruiting for their company or all these different examples that we hadn't thought of beforehand, but were perfect examples of all the different ways that you could use this application. And when we started to see those blog posts happen and we we saw people were writing it on their own without us asking them to, that's when it started to you know click like, hey, we might be onto something here these people are so excited about what we're doing that they're willing to market to their own channels and tell their friends and the people that follow them about this product without us even getting involved. Um, and so that those 20 million people, all of that's word of mouth. Like that's how we got all the signups that we got so far. Awesome. And I can tell you in Jamaica here, you have a lot of raving fans. You know, I learned about Trello uh, through a colleague of mine, which I also brought on the show. His name is Kemal Brown. And he is a raving fan. And I know others that are using the program. I'm I'm actually using it myself, you know, as I organize my blog post, which I'm going to be doing on, on, on my website, which, which is to be launched soon. So it is quite effective, quite an effective tool, you know. Um, I'm also a supporter and a fan of Trello. Now, when you were in that competition, Michael, you came in second place, right? You didn't win, yep. as it were. No. How, what were the thoughts that went through your mind? I mean, you, you, you almost won in that instance. What were some of the thoughts that went through your mind, you know, as you, as you recognize that you did not get that first place? Well, so, you know, we, this was about five or six years ago. And, and the thing is, like, we, we, we had a little bit of a different story than, than, than just that, that competition and that, um, that comp or that competition in the conference, it, we had been making software and had a software company for ten years before that, and this was one of the products that we made. And so, in in a lot of ways, you know, we were funding the development of Trello through the sales of some of the other products that we were selling, unrelated to Trello. So we weren't in a typical scenario where you know, this was our big chance. We had to go win the competition in order to get the funds in order to continue the company. Like this is, this happened much later in our life cycle of our, of, of my software career and my co-founder and I, Joel Spolsky. And, and, you know, that's interesting because Trello and another, another site that we made that, um, if you're a software developer, you might've heard of, it's called Stack Overflow, which is a Q and A site for developers. Yes, I've actually heard about it. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> that also was a product that was a joint venture between Fog Creek and another, uh, uh, uh a colleague of ours. And those, those super successful and well-known products came much later in our history because we took a lot of the lessons that we learned over the, the, you know, the first decade from like 2000 to 2010 and applied them these later things but we've made many different software products over the years and some of them were the right product at the wrong time or the right product marketed to the wrong people or the right idea but just built in the wrong way and you know so there was a lot of failures along the way so when you look at it you say oh trello it's very simple you came up with this idea and it was a huge success and it's like that was built on a whole decade's worth of experience and then not only that but all the you know the luck and the privilege that we had in order to be in the the place we were in our lives to be able to to take that leap um so so a lot of different things went into that you know what seems like an overnight success was actually a really long journey and you spoke of some of uh, some lessons learned what were some of those lessons 
Um, so I'll tell you some uh, the apps that we built. So I don't know if you ever heard of uh, Log Me In or Go to My PC, which was uh, there was uh, there were companies which allowed you to get onto a remote computer. Oh, and okay. It um they it's like uh they they were IPO'd and, and became billion dollar companies on the on the stock market. But if you roll back the clock to probably like eight or nine years ago, it was really that technology wasn't widespread. It was really hard if you had one computer in one place to get onto another computer somewhere else. And we had developed a tool that allowed you to do that. It was called Copilot. It still exists if you go to copilot.com. And we had built it for ourselves because we were actually trying to help our customers install our software on their computer and we struggled with them trying to tell us over the phone what they were seeing. <laughs> I know what that is like. <laughs> right. And so we were like, if we, you know, we realized that we could use the software It's like, if I could just see their computer and control it, I would solve this problem. And nowadays that's like a, that's pretty easy to right, do, right. but back then it wasn't. And so we built a tool that allowed you to do that and we marketed it to customer support agents. And, which was so it was a great tool and it was the wrong marketing strategy because it grew and we certainly made a lot of money off of it but p the people took that same idea and put a lot more investment into it and then marketed it to you know all IT groups or all companies like everyone's going to have this need they're going to have multiple devices and they're going to want to get onto those devices and those companies that go to my PC and log me in um became huge successes and so we had like the right idea the right time but we just didn't market it to the right people. And I think when we started Trello, that was part of learning about how people do, you know, they, they you might use the term project management to describe what Trello does, but I think that's a very narrow view of what Trello does because I don't think a lot of people think about the problems that they're solving with Trello with that term. Like, I don't think if you're trying to figure out your guests for your podcast, you're not going to go to Google and say, you know what I need is project management software, right? Like you're, <laughs> you're true. You're, you're, you might, you might use Excel mm -hmm. to do it, or you might use um, Google sheets, or you might use email. You might just j jot it down in a word doc or something like you, you'll just look for a tool that you know about and you'll figure out how to solve the problem with that. And I think Trello really hit the right um, level of structure you know, just enough structure for people to kind of get and using a metaphor that they understood so that they could apply it to so many different problems. I think that was the trick with Trello, knowing that we were going to build something that we we're going to market to everybody and not just a very specific um, vertical, you know, like sales or this isn't going to be a sales tool. It's not going to be a marketing tool. It's not a tool for podcast creators, right? This is just, this is a general tool that anyone can use to, to get, on the same page with some other people. And so, so that was one of the lessons we learned is like, if you're going to go after a big market, it's a bigger risk, right? It's much harder to get a lot of people to use your product because there's not really a category defined for what Trello is. Um, and so that's a difficult thing, but if you can get enough people to love the product and they can tell other people about it and you have passionate fans, then then your the 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 passion of your your users will do the marketing for you exactly and you know you get your raving fans uh, so the importance of having the right marketing plan was one of the lessons learned um along over the years is there another lesson that you thought you could share with us yeah there's you know i think software today the way that people use software there's a much more because we have devices with us all the time, so now, you know, right before we started Trello, the iPhone came out and Android was picking up and the sort of idea of smartphones and people were, that's, it was, that was only like six or seven years ago. You know, it seems like it was longer, but, <laughs> um, but it, it wasn't, you know, you sort of go to work. Yeah, you had laptops and things like that, but generally people went to work and they had their computer at work and then they went home and they weren't sort of connected at all hours. And now... You know, everyone's connected all the time. You can run apps on your phone. You, they all talk to the cloud. It's like everyone's just connected. And, um, you know, knowing that that was going to happen, doing building Trello at that time um, and the way that people's work and their personal life and the tools that they use to solve problems in their work and personal life becomes a little bit more fluid. And I think that their relationship with software then becomes um, 
more they 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 want tools that work the way that they work not necessarily it's sort of like you don't you know you could come up with a tool to try to think about how people are going to do a certain task beforehand and then give them that solution but in this world i think people are much more looking for tools that let them express themselves in the tool so you know some of the there's little things in trello like the ability if you upload an attachment that's an image you can make the front of the card show the image right you can change the background image for the board and so there's these little features that let you personalize the board and over time when you go to look at that trello board you see a you know not only do you see like the 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 cards having to do with things that you're working on but the but the images and the, the the sort of feeling that you get when you look at it it feels very personal to you right it doesn't feel like you're using an enterprise piece of software to solve some problem or some very um you know not uh, emotion like there's an emotional connection i think to the software and i think that's why a lot of people it's one of the reasons why a lot of people love trello and i think it it has to do with that connection and being able to personalize the application to the way that they work and also the way that they think about their problems on that note michael let's take a break and i want to say you know a big thank you to our sponsor Peak performers, success is something that we gradually work towards as an end goal, but we need it to be in the right environment to make it happen. Book Affilio is dedicated to providing a space for book, coffee, and tea lovers, creatives, educators, students, and professionals who want ideas, innovation, and inspiration. They have a wide variety of high-quality books, a cafe, events such as book launches, signings, and art exhibitions, professional services, uniquely tailored to your needs, culture, and tastes. Their environment provides for the full literary arts experience, allowing for multifaceted creative expressions. Find them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Bookophilia. Welcome back. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for staying with us. And now we want to move into hearing from you about maybe your worst moment as an entrepreneur that you would have faced. What was that like? Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. You know, one of the hardest things on the journey for Trello um, was originally the product was started within the software company that I was talking about before called Fog Creek Software. So this was, we had a software company. One of the things that we did was Trello. We had a couple people working on that. After a couple of years, we realized there were probably about four different things that we wanted to do for Trello. And we weren't going to be able to do them all at the same time because we didn't have enough people to do them. So like we needed to hire more people. There was no reason that we couldn't do them all at the same time. We just didn't have the people. And because we were growing the product on the profits from the other things that we were selling, we were sort of constrained. And at that point in time, that's when we realized, hey, we should go and get funding so that we can accelerate the growth of Trello and hire these people because we know it's we have something here and it's working. And we talked to some investors that we already knew. And what we had to do was we had to spin off Trello from Fog Creek. And what that meant was, you know, there's a lot of the paperwork and the sort of the legal aspect of doing that. But the trickiest part was that we essentially had to make two companies. And the identity of the employees in those companies then, you know, got sort of split in two. And yes, they were still very, we shared the same office and those sorts of things, but that it, it, it's a very tricky and, and um, it's a difficult process to go through that, I think, emotionally. Yeah, it sounds for like a, a broken relationship, of, if you will, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Breaking <And> up. <laughs> everyone can see from the outside, they can say, this is the right business decision. Like, we should definitely do this. This is going to let that that product move faster and go in that direction. But I think there's also a melancholy aspect of it. It's sort of, you know, it's like... It, you know, it's a, it's a change. It's an end of an era, right? Like it, you, things were great. They were this way and now it's going to change and be this way. And I think as you go through that, it's, I told the story, even through the acquisition, we, you know, Trello has since been acquired by um, uh, uh, a company 
called Atlassian. Um, and this happened a month or two ago. And, and we're going through that process now, which is, you know, we're now part of a 2000 person company. We went from a hundred person group at Trello to a 2000 person company at Atlassian. And it's That's a change. Major. That's major. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, it, and, and so you, you, I tell the story, I say to people, you know, if you, you might live in an apartment in the city, right. And then someday, you know, you get older and you, you buy a house out in the suburbs and it's like, you move out of that apartment, you're very excited about your house. But when you leave the city, it's sad, right? Like you, there's all these memories and the sort of the way it was. And so even though on the face of it, everything is good, it, it doesn't mean that it can't also be a process that you go through. Like changes, things, things are different. And, and you should recognize that and be aware that, that it, is, it is changing. And so I think that, that the, specifically when we went through that split off from Fog Creek because we, were, we didn't have – that much experience doing something like that um it was a very difficult moment to just try to keep people focused and and energized and enthusiastic tell me something uh, michael we have a lot of startups here in the caribbean region and i know you know there is there's an emotional connection to products and services that we start and for some reason even when it's the right thing to do even when it's the best thing to do, to let go and to let get other people involved, even in terms of bringing on more team members to, you know, shed some of the work from your shoulder, it becomes a challenge because you're so emotionally attached to that product or that service. Talk to us a a little about that. Yeah, I think that that is, uh, so this, this comes up. So I'm a, I'm a programmer from, you know, my, my, my background is I got a computer science degree in school. Um, and I, when I started the company, I was writing the software that we, um, sold. I have not written a single line of code in Trello. And it's because, you know, at that point in time in the company's trajectory, um, there were 20 engineers working here and it really, my job was much more of a management function. And I was, you know, trying to get things out of the way so that the developers could do what they needed to do. And, you know, that was a, that was a long transition for me, but it's, a, it's definitely like a change that you go through as you start to scale and grow. And not everyone is interested in that, right? Like some people just don't want to do that and that's fine. But if your company is going to grow, that, there, there should be somebody that is doing that management or somebody that is sort of elevating what the, how, you know, you have to scale the company up essentially. And you're going to need a lot of individual contributors and then you're going to need a lot of communication. And how is that communication going to happen? Um, I think I, I've told people as CEO, there's sort of three things that I did. Um, and some of those things were very natural for, for me and then some of those things were not. And I think the thing that was very natural for me was the first thing is don't run out of money. Um, and so I think like every day, you know, sort of as CEO, you're supposed to make sure you have cash in the bank and <laughs> yeah. you can pay people because <laughs> if that one fails, forget everything else, right? So, so that was don't run out of money. Um, the second thing was recruit people. And this sort of... Um, gets to what you're talking about as far as scaling and growing the company. Like you need to find people, you ideally you'd like to find people that are smarter than you that are, that are better at doing the jobs that need to be done. And as you grow, those people will be much more, they will be more specialists, right? Whereas in the early days you, you function more as a generalist and you kind of do everything yourself. You're the entrepreneur. You just sort of figure it out if you can. And as time goes on, you'll hire more specialists and they'll be really good at that specific thing and hopefully even better than you would have been. Um, I know the engineers at our company are way better developers than I would ever be. Um, and that's, that's part of the success of being a, a, you know, an entrepreneur and a leader um, is, is finding those people. Um, and this, and the third thing, what was it? Don't run out of money, recruit people. Oh, and keep the vision. So I think when you're small, if you only have like a couple of people, you kind of all mind meld and you share the vision, you know what you're doing, you know what the, the focus is, whether you would do something or would not do something like, would we add this feature or would we not? Um, but as you scale that sort of oral tradition or the things that you know in your head in the core group from the beginning knew you have to start to figure out how to spread that throughout the company and I, you know some people call this the, it's the culture it encompasses your values and the things that you care about which isn't just words but also the actions that you take and the things that you do inside your company but 
it's your job as a CEO to keep that vision and make sure you repeat it over and over and over again and tell people what it is. And I think that it's not the, – the most interesting aspect of that is not necessarily trying to tell people what to do because that's not what you're doing. What it is is telling people what not to focus on because in a startup, the problem is you have so many different things that you could do. Mm-hmm. And if you try to, <laughs> if you try to do them all, you will fail. Right. Because you just can't like it's just that's that's the problem. You have to figure out which ones are important. And so doing that as you grow, you need some kind of metric, something at least to measure these different activities by so that you can figure out whether you would do A over B. You know, like, should I should I focus on this this quarter or should I focus on that? And there's structure ways to do this through uh, what they call OKRs, objectives and key results. But keeping that vision of like, hey, this is what our goal is. This is what we're focused on now. It's, it's literally saying, hey, those other things that we could be focused on, those are awesome ideas, and we want to do those someday, but we don't have the resources to do all those things right now, and this is what our focus and our vision should be, should be you know, directed toward. You know, um, as you talk, Michael, it's, I recognize, even in my own journey how important it is to be focused you know when you when you are creative so many ideas come flashing through your mind (laughs) and it takes focus you know to and and commitment to stay dedicated to one even if you grow it to a particular level and then you say okay now I can move on to something else but whilst you know we have a tendency sometimes to want to do everything at the same time and therein lies the problem you never can achieve growth that way right The Caribbean region has seen over the last couple of years, you know, a a prevalence in the area of technology, more funding. We're getting more funding from multilaterals such as the World Bank, and they're investing heavily in training, you know, and and so on. Does your company have a paid forward initiative to provide support to, if not necessarily Caribbean entrepreneurs, but even entrepreneurs that are just starting in any other area? Yeah, so we... um a lot of the things that we focus on in the city, um, you know, one of the big things for entrepreneurs right now, well, not just for entrepreneurs, but for tech in general, I think we can set this, like show the rest of the world that, um, well, we have a long way to go, but we can be leaders in diversity and inclusion in the way that we, um, fix some of the problems that facing the entire world, but specifically technology. And some of those things, like I think getting involved in um, the, I'll give you a specific example at Trello. We, we opened up a, a role called a junior developer position because what we saw was it was hard for, um, we weren't get we weren't finding if, if our qualifications were, you know, you had to have a CS degree from a good school and like there were all these sort of roadblocks in the way we weren't going to get a very diverse candidate pool. Um, and so we had to figure out like, how do we short circuit this? Cause we know there's a lot of talented people. And if we look around New York city, for example, there's all these boot camps that are training people from other uh, industries to come over into, um, into, into, into programming. And so we realized that we, in order to support that, we had to change like internally our structure for how we were hiring people. And so we created a junior developer position that we we're hiring for. And the idea behind that was, hey, we could, you know, yeah, people, they could go to these boot camps for six months and then they can come over and work with us for two years. And at that point, they'll be, you know, it would be like the same as if they had gone to school for four years and had the internships that all the other people that we were hiring before. And that way we'll get a much more diverse candidate pool instead of just blaming the problem on the, you know, the resumes that we get. It's sort of like, what can we, what, how are we going to fix this? So that was, that was one thing that we do. And I think, um, you know, that's important. And, and I think, you know, there's a lot of things that Alassian, as a company has done, the founders are, are have started a uh, a, a, a a drive that one founder Scott is um, started a program called Pledge One Percent, where they take they're trying to get entrepreneurs to pledge one percent of the equity of their company to charity and philanthropy. And some of the programs are directly um, trying to help entrepreneurs. Um, and the idea is that it's much easier for an entrepreneur to sort of get on board very early, 
you know, because they say, oh, 1%, it's a very small, you know, when you start out. And then, then it is to say, oh, during an acquisition, like, hey, will you donate $10 million to, you know, charity? It's a much, it's harder to do it later on where it's much easier to do it um, earlier. And I, I saw some of the programs have to do with, um, you know, helping entrepreneurs get started in, in areas that normally wouldn't get the support that, you know, it's not, it's not the U.S., it's not the West Coast. Um, and so I think that those, those initiatives are where you have to focus instead of just trying to say, Hey, it's, it's, it's hard because we just don't get the resumes that we need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. Finally, uh, we need to get from you a piece of advice that you can offer to persons interested in entering the field of tech. You know, one thing I would say is that one, one talking a little bit more of the developer position, the boot boot camps that we were working with in the city, one thing that we did was we actually took a bunch of the engineers that were graduating from the boot camps and did mock interviews with them. Um, because I think that people that aren't used to technical interviews, like they can be a little bit intimidating. And once you've done a bunch of them, they get a little bit more um, easy to do. This isn't necessarily for entrepreneurs, but for people looking for jobs in, in the tech industry. Um, and so that was actually really helpful for those people because it was like, Hey, you can do these like practice, right? Like go through these interview processes. And then when you actually get into the real interview, it's much more, um, easy. And now some advice for an entrepreneur, I think we talked about this before, but I think that the hardest thing is focusing on the one thing, you know, it's not, it's not coming up with a new idea. Like you see people, this is always the classic mistake where somebody says, Hey, I have an idea for a startup, but I'm going to need you to sign this NDA or I can't, or don't tell anybody <laughs> else this idea. And it's like you, if you think that the idea is the important piece, then you have no concept of what the no. hard part is, right? It's all about the execution. execution exactly. Like, like you're starting this podcast now, right? And it's like, you literally could set that goal where it's like, I I can't wait till I say, you know, this is our thousandth episode of the podcast, you know, and it's like all the small steps that you'll have to take in, in, in between now and then. And that's, that's how you're going to get there. Right. It's not, that's a long journey. Right. And it, it's, it, it's the little steps that you take along the way. And there's that focus of always, you know, coming back to it every day when it even seems hard and difficult and you just say, yeah, but I know that there's a way around this. I know that I'm going to get through this and you just keep working through it and you recognize that there's going to be these ups, there's going to be the downs um, and it's going to happen. In fact, that was why I pointed out, you know, the journey for Trello is like, it's really important to focus on all the failures that came before it. You know, there were a lot of things that we never even shipped software products that we, that we worked on for months and months and months and never even, they never even saw the light of day because they just never got any traction or they just weren't very good. Um, and so it's like, that's part of the experience. And every time you fail, that's a lesson that you learn and you put it in your repository of knowledge and you apply it in the future. And someday they all come together and help you when you get the, when everything lines up and the serendipity of the moment is there, you can, you can get a big win. Awesome. For those who would have missed it, we're talking with Michael Pryor. He is the co-founder of Trello. And Michael, for those who uh, would have missed it again, leave your Twitter handle with us, please. Sure. It's Michael Pryor, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-P-R-Y-O-R. And Michael, it is my absolute pleasure to say thank Thank you. Thank you so much for being a part of the Entrepreneurial You. I know that our community was inspired. You inspired me and it has been awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. That's it, my peak performers. We have come to the end of another inspiring episode of the Entrepreneurial You. Thank you as always for tuning in. Giving you some extra info here. If you really love the Jamaican culture and want to express that love by wearing t-shirts, then head right over to patwaapparel.com. That's P-A-T-W-A-A-P-P-A-R-E-L.com. Patwaapparel.com. Until next time, I'm Henika Watkiss Porto. Remember, you were born to win, but to be a winner, you must plan to win, prepare to win, and expect to win. What good? <laughs> <laughs>